The Epistle to the Colossians, penned by the Apostle Paul under divine inspiration, stands as a monumental letter in the New Testament addressing fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith and countering heretical teachings that threatened the early church. Written to the believers in Coloss, a city influenced by a myriad of cultural and religious ideas, this letter is a powerful affirmation of the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ in all things. Paul, a servant chosen by God to proclaim the gospel, writes not only to confront false teachings, but also to encourage and strengthen the believers in their walk with Christ. His message is clear and unwavering. Christ is preeminent, and in Him alone we find the fullness of God and the complete answer to our spiritual needs. As we delve into the opening verses of this profound letter, Colossians chapter 1, verse 1 through 8, we are ushered into a world of deep spiritual truths that are as relevant today as they were in Paul's time. These verses lay the groundwork for the entire epistle, presenting key themes such as divine calling, the grace and peace of God, the transformative power of the gospel, and the importance of faith, love, and hope in the life of a believer. In these opening remarks, Paul sets the tone for his message to the Colossians, a message that calls for a steadfast adherence to the truth of the gospel amidst a sea of conflicting ideologies. He commends their faith and love, attributes born of their hope in Christ, and encourages them to continue in the truth they have received. As we explore these initial verses, we are reminded of the timeless and unchanging nature of the gospel, the central role of Christ in our faith, and the call to live out this faith with sincerity and vigor. Thus, as we embark on this exploration of Colossians chapter 1 verses 1 through 8, let us do so with open hearts and minds, ready to be challenged and transformed by the powerful, life-changing truths contained within these sacred texts. Let us hold fast to the gospel, grow in our understanding of God's will, and live in a manner worthy of our calling in Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 1 verse 1, penned by the Apostle Paul under divine inspiration, states, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. This verse is not merely an introduction, it is a profound declaration of divine authority and calling. Paul, once a fierce opponent of the Christian faith, was transformed by the sovereign will of God to become a chosen vessel to carry his message. This transformation and appointment were not due to Paul's merit or desire, but solely by God's grace and purpose. Timothy, mentioned as a brother, signifies the unity and fellowship in the body of Christ reminding believers that they are part of a larger family, bound together not by blood, but by faith in Jesus Christ. This verse, therefore, is a call to every believer, reminding us that our identity and purpose in this world are not self-determined, but are anchored in the divine will and calling of God. It challenges us to consider our own calling in Christ, urging us to live in a manner worthy of the calling we have received, fully committed to the cause of Christ, under the guidance and sovereignty of God. Continuing from verse 1, we delve into the rich depths of verse 2, which declares, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Coloss, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This verse is a testament to the transformative power of the gospel. The recipients, referred to as saints and faithful brethren, were once estranged from God, yet now they are set apart, sanctified by their faith in Christ. This transformation is not a result of their own doing, but a gift from God, as signified by the words, grace to you and peace. Grace, the unmerited favor of God, and peace, a deep-seated spiritual tranquility, come not from worldly sources, but directly from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. This verse, therefore, is not just a greeting. 
it is a profound reminder of the new identity and blessings that believers have in Christ. It underscores the truth that our standing before God is not based on our righteousness, but on Christ's. As we move from understanding our divine calling and unity in Christ from verse 1, verse 2 deepens our appreciation of the grace we have received and the peace we can experience in Christ, encouraging us to live in light of these profound truths, steadfast in faith and unwavering in our commitment to the gospel. Building on the profound truths of verse 2, we encounter the heartfelt expression in Colossians verse 3. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. This verse is a stirring call to gratitude and intercession. Paul, despite his own trials, exemplifies a heart overflowing with thankfulness to God, not just for his own salvation, but for the work of God in the lives of others. This thankfulness is not a fleeting emotion, but a continual fervent practice as he prays always for the believers in Colossae. The verse teaches us that our faith journey is not solitary. We are called to bear one another's burdens in prayer, interceding for our brothers and sisters in Christ. It also challenges us to cultivate a spirit of gratitude in all circumstances, recognizing God's hand at work in and around us. As believers who have received grace and peace from God, as highlighted in verse 2, our natural response should be one of ceaseless prayer and thanksgiving. This reflects a heart truly transformed by the gospel, one that acknowledges God's sovereignty and goodness in every aspect of life, inspiring us to live in a state of continuous prayer and gratitude. From the posture of ceaseless prayer and gratitude in verse 3, we are led to the grounds of such thankfulness in verse 4, which reads, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. This verse reveals the dual hallmarks of genuine faith, belief in Christ and love for fellow believers. The faith of the Colossians in Jesus Christ is not merely intellectual assent, but a transformative, active trust that reshapes their entire existence. It's a faith that is visible, evident in their actions, and known across communities. Similarly, their love for all the saints is a tangible demonstration of the change wrought by the Holy Spirit in their hearts. This love is not selective or superficial, but extends to all who are united in Christ, transcending cultural, social, and personal barriers. This verse challenges us to examine our faith and love. True faith in Christ is always accompanied by a deep, abiding love for our fellow believers. It's a call to selfless service, to put the needs of others above our own, and to love unconditionally as Christ loved us. In a world where love is often conditional and self-serving, this verse calls us to a higher standard, one that reflects the heart of Jesus, binding us together in a community marked by faith and love. In the flowing narrative of Paul's letter, verse 5 brings into focus the foundation and hope of the faith and love mentioned in verse 4. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. This verse powerfully asserts that the Christian's faith and love are not grounded in earthly circumstances or transient emotions, but in the unshakable hope stored up in heaven. This hope is not a wishful thinking, but a confident assurance in the promises of God revealed through the gospel, the ultimate truth that has transformed lives and continues to do so. It's a hope that transcends the trials and tribulations of this world, offering a steadfast anchor for the soul. This heavenly hope is a reminder that our present sufferings are momentary and pale in comparison to the eternal glory awaiting us. It fuels our faith, motivates our love for others, and gives us the strength to endure. This verse challenges us to lift our eyes above the temporal and fix them on the eternal, to live not for the fleeting pleasures of this world, but for the enduring joy 
set before us in Christ. It is a call to anchor our lives in the truth of the gospel, allowing it to shape our every thought, word, and deed. Verse 6 seamlessly extends the theme of the transformative power of the gospel, declaring, which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you, since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. This verse highlights the universal and fruit-bearing nature of the gospel. It's not confined to a single region or people group, but is spreading across the world, transcending cultural and geographical boundaries. The gospel's power is evident in its ability to produce spiritual fruit in the lives of those who embrace it. This fruit is not a mere external conformity to religious practices, but a deep, internal transformation that manifests in love, joy, peace, and other Christ-like qualities. The phrase, since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, underscores that this transformation begins at the point of understanding and accepting the true grace of God. This verse calls believers to recognize the vastness and efficacy of the gospel. It's a reminder that the message we carry is not a local or outdated message, but a living, active truth that continually transforms lives around the world. It challenges us to be active participants in this worldwide movement, to not only embrace the gospel personally, but to share it fervently, contributing to the spiritual harvest that God is bringing forth across the face of the earth. As we delve deeper into the truths of Colossians, verse 7 provides a vital link in the chain of Paul's message. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. This verse introduces Epaphras, a key figure in the Colossian church's spiritual journey. He's described as a dear fellow servant and a faithful minister of Christ, emphasizing his dedication and loyalty to the gospel and the believers in Coloss. The phrase, as you also learn from, highlights the importance of godly leadership and teaching in the life of a church. Epaphras was not just a messenger, he was a shepherd, guiding the Colossians in the truths of the gospel. This verse is a powerful reminder of the crucial role that faithful, Christ-centered teaching plays in the growth and maturity of believers. It challenges us to value and uphold the teaching of the Word, recognizing that sound doctrine is essential for our spiritual well-being. It also serves as a call to be discerning, ensuring that those who teach us are faithful to the core truths of the gospel, not swayed by the changing tides of culture or personal opinion. As Epaphras was a faithful minister for the Colossians, so we must seek and honor those who faithfully minister Christ's truths to us, recognizing their role in our spiritual journey and growth. In verse 8, the Apostle Paul further cements the significance of authentic Christian fellowship and communication, stating, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. This verse is a powerful testament to the evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in the lives of the Colossian believers, as observed and reported by Epaphras. The phrase, your love in the Spirit, is particularly striking as it underscores that true Christian love is not merely a human emotion or effort, but a fruit of the Spirit, a divine attribute that flows from a life yielded to God. This kind of love is supernatural, transcending human limitations and reflecting the very nature of God. It is a love that is selfless, sacrificial, and serving, mirroring the love Christ has for his church. This declaration by Epaphras not only serves as a commendation of the Colossians' spiritual maturity, but also as a profound encouragement to Paul and his companions. It reminds us that our faith and love have far-reaching impacts, extending beyond our immediate context and serving as a testimony to others about the transformative power of the gospel. 
This verse calls us to examine our own lives. Is our love characterized by the work of the Spirit? Does it testify to the reality of Christ in us? In a world rife with superficial and self-centered versions of love, we are challenged to embody this love in the Spirit, a love that is deep, genuine, and reflective of our identity in Christ. In concluding our journey through Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, we are confronted with a rich tapestry of divine truth and spiritual exhortation. These verses, penned by Paul under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, reveal the profound depths of God's work in and through His people. Beginning with Paul's apostolic authority and Timothy's brotherhood in Christ, we are reminded that our Christian walk is rooted in God's sovereign call and unified by our shared faith in Jesus Christ. As we move through the greeting of grace and peace, we see a picture of the Christian's new identity and standing before God, a people set apart, recipients of unmerited favor, and bearers of a peace that surpasses all understanding. The subsequent verses emphasize the essential elements of the Christian life, faith in Christ, love for the saints, hope laid up in heaven, and the transformative power of the gospel. These are not mere theological concepts, they are the very pillars upon which our lives are to be built. The mention of Epaphras, a faithful minister of Christ, brings to light the importance of godly leadership and the value of being taught and nurtured in the truth of the gospel. Finally, the report of the Colossians' love in the Spirit challenges us to reflect on the authenticity and source of our own love. It's a love that should emanate from our deep connection with God, powered by the Holy Spirit, transcending human capability and reflecting the character of Christ Himself. In essence, Colossians chapter 1 verses 1 through 8 is an urgent call to the church today. It calls us to a higher standard of living, a life that is anchored in the truth of the gospel, characterized by a profound love for God and for others, and marked by a steadfast hope in the promises of God. It's a call to not only understand these truths intellectually, but to embody them in every aspect of our lives. As we navigate the complexities and challenges of our current age, may these verses serve as a constant reminder of who we are in Christ, what we are called to do, and the glorious hope that awaits us. Let us, therefore, press on in faith, abound in love, and hold fast to the hope of the gospel that in all things Christ might be preeminent. In the opening chapter of Colossians, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, addresses the faithful in Colossae with a deep sense of gratitude and affection. In verses 1 through 8, he acknowledges their faith in Christ Jesus and the love they have for all the saints, spurred by the hope laid up for them in heaven. This hope is not a mere wishful thinking, but a certain assurance grounded in the truth of the gospel which has been bearing fruit and increasing in the whole world. As we delve into verses 9 through 14, the focus shifts from Paul's initial greetings and commendations to a profound and fervent prayer for the believers. This passage is not just a prayer, but a roadmap for spiritual growth and understanding. It is a call to a deeper, more intimate knowledge of God's will, marked by wisdom and spiritual understanding. The journey through these verses is a clarion call to a life that reflects the transformation that comes from a true understanding of the gospel. This is a call to not only understand the will of God, but to live it out in a manner that is worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. It is a call to endurance and patience with joy, rooted in the strength that comes from His glorious might. As we venture deeper into this passage, we are reminded of the stark contrast between the domain of darkness and the kingdom of the sun. This is a vivid portrayal of the transformative power of the gospel, a transition from the power of darkness 
to the kingdom of light. In essence, this portion of scripture is a deep dive into the heart of Christian living, a guide to understanding and applying the profound truths of the gospel in our daily lives. It challenges us to look beyond the surface, to grapple with the hard truths of our faith, and to live in a way that truly reflects the transformative power of the gospel. This is not a journey for the faint-hearted, but for those who are committed to living out their faith with integrity, passion, and unwavering conviction. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 states, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This verse, a beacon of unwavering faith, implores us to seek an unrelenting pursuit of God's will, grounded in deep wisdom and spiritual understanding. It reminds us that our journey in faith is not a solitary endeavor, but one bolstered by the prayers and support of fellow believers. The Apostle Paul emphasizes the importance of ceaseless prayer, not as a ritualistic practice, but as a heartfelt plea for divine guidance in understanding the depths of God's will. This pursuit is not for the faint of heart, nor is it a path of convenience. It demands a relentless quest for truth, a willingness to be transformed by the profound wisdom that comes only from a spiritual understanding rooted in God's Word. This verse challenges us to dive deeper into our faith, to seek beyond the superficial, and to be unafraid of the transformative power of true spiritual wisdom that shapes and molds our lives according to His divine purpose. Building upon the deep-seated call in verse 9 to embrace God's will with wisdom and spiritual understanding, verse 10 declares that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This passage serves as a solemn reminder that our quest for divine wisdom is not an end in itself, but a means to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. It is a call to action, urging us to bear fruit in every good work. This is not a passive, effortless walk. It demands active engagement, a life that visibly reflects the glory and character of God. Fully pleasing Him is the benchmark, and it is a high one, requiring steadfast dedication and unwavering commitment to His standards. Our actions and choices are to be measured against His holiness, challenging us to rise above mediocrity and complacency. Furthermore, this scripture compels us to continuously grow in our understanding of God, suggesting that this journey of faith is a progressive one, always moving forward, always deepening. This is not for the spiritually lethargic or the casual believer. It is a call to those who are committed to living out their faith with vigor and integrity, constantly seeking to align their lives more closely with God's will and purpose. As we delve deeper into Colossians, the transition from verse 10 to verse 11 brings us to an empowering truth. Verse 11 says, Strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. This verse illuminates the profound reality that the journey of walking worthy of the Lord, as outlined in verse 10, is not one we undertake in our own strength. Instead, it is by His glorious power that we are strengthened. This strength is not merely for the easy moments or the days of triumph, but significantly, it is for the endurance of trials with patience and long-suffering, infused with joy. This is a hard truth for many, for it acknowledges the inevitability of trials and difficulties in the Christian walk. Yet it also offers immeasurable hope and assurance, reminding us that we are not left to face these challenges alone or in our own frailty. The might we receive from God is not a temporary boost or a fleeting surge of courage. It is a constant, unyielding force that enables us to endure with a spirit not crushed or embittered 
but filled with joy. This joy is not of the world. It is a profound, deep-seated joy that arises from the knowledge of God's unwavering presence and power in our lives, even in the midst of our longest and most trying battles. This verse, therefore, stands as a beacon of hope, encouraging us to embrace both the trials and triumphs of our faith journey, empowered by His might and rejoicing in His steadfast love and strength. Transitioning from the empowering assurance of God's strength in verse 11, verse 12 further elevates our focus, stating, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. This verse shifts our gaze from the present struggles and strengthens us to a future-oriented hope, a profound gratitude towards the Father. It is not by our merit or efforts that we are made partakers of this glorious inheritance. It is the Father who has qualified us. This is a truth that humbles and centers us, reminding us of the unmerited favor we have received through grace. The inheritance mentioned here is not of earthly treasures or transient accolades, but of eternal significance, reserved for those who are in the light, a clear demarcation from the darkness of this world. This inheritance is not just a future promise, but also a present reality that influences how we live our lives now in a state of continuous thanksgiving, recognizing the immense value of what we have been given access to through the Father's grace. This perspective is not one of easy optimism. It is a sober acknowledgement of the cost of this inheritance and a call to live in a manner that reflects the sanctity of what we have been granted. In essence, verse 12 calls us to a life of gratitude and holy living, recognizing the gravity of our calling and the profound generosity of the Father in allowing us to partake in the inheritance of the saints. Building upon the profound gratitude expressed in verse 12 for our inheritance through the Father's grace, verse 13 further deepens our understanding of this divine deliverance. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. This verse is a stark reminder of the transformative power of our faith. It speaks of a deliverance not just in metaphorical terms but in the literal sense, a transition from the dominion of darkness into the glorious kingdom of light. This deliverance is not a simple change of circumstances but a radical shift in our spiritual state. We were once captives in a realm devoid of true light, ensnared by the deceits and lures of a world in rebellion against its creator. The transition into the kingdom of the Son, whom the Father loves, signifies a profound change in allegiance, identity, and purpose. This is not a journey that one undertakes lightly. It is a passage marked by the shedding of old selves and the embracing of a new creation in Christ. The gravity of this deliverance is immense. It is a rescue operation of the highest order, orchestrated by the love and sovereignty of God. It underscores the seriousness with which we must regard our former state and the magnanimity of the grace that has brought us into the light. As recipients of such extraordinary grace, we are called to live in a manner worthy of this high calling, fully aware of the darkness we have been saved from and the glorious light into which we have been brought. The profound narrative of deliverance in verse 13 seamlessly leads us into the heart of our redemption, as articulated in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. This verse is the cornerstone of our faith, declaring that our redemption, our very rescue from the clutches of darkness, was secured through the most profound sacrifice, the blood of the Son. This is no abstract concept of salvation. It is deeply personal, vividly illustrating the cost at which our freedom was bought. The blood of Christ, shed on the cross is not just a symbol of our faith. It is the very means by which we are reconciled to God, the path 
through which we receive the forgiveness of our sins. This verse challenges us to confront the weighty reality of our sinfulness and the immense grace that has been extended to us. It is a sobering reminder that our redemption was not cheap or easy. It was purchased at the highest price, demanding our utmost reverence and devotion. This redemption through His blood is not merely a historical event to be acknowledged. It is the pivotal moment that defines our existence and our destiny. It demands a response of gratitude, a life lived in acknowledgement of the gravity of our sin and the magnificence of His sacrifice. As recipients of such unfathomable forgiveness, we are called to live not as those who take this sacrifice lightly, but as those transformed by the power of His blood, walking in the newness of life that comes from being forgiven and set free. In the journey through Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 through 14, we are confronted with a profound narrative that encapsulates the heart of our faith. Beginning with a call to wisdom and spiritual understanding in verse 9, we are urged to live lives worthy of our calling, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. This passage is not a mere call to intellectual assent, but a fervent plea for a life deeply rooted in Christ, marked by a relentless pursuit of His will. The subsequent verses unravel the magnificence of God's power at work in us, reminding us that we are not left to navigate this path in our own strength. We are fortified by His might, enabling us to endure trials with patience and joy. This truth is neither comfortable nor easy, as it acknowledges the inevitability of suffering, yet it also offers immeasurable hope, anchoring us in the promise of His unfailing presence. As we progress, the Scripture reveals the extraordinary nature of our redemption. We are not simply improved versions of our former selves, we have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. This is a radical transformation, a complete overhaul of our identity and destiny. The gravity of this transition cannot be overstated. It is a shift from death to life, from despair to hope. The culmination of this passage in verse 14, with its emphasis on redemption through the blood of Christ and the forgiveness of sins, is the pinnacle of this divine narrative. This is the crux of our belief, the axis on which our entire faith revolves. The blood of Christ is not a mere theological concept. It is the lifeblood of our salvation, the foundation of our hope, and the source of our freedom. This passage is a call to a faith that is alive, active, and anchored in the profound truths of the gospel. It is a call to a life that is not content with superficial religious observance, but is deeply committed to a transformative relationship with Christ. It challenges us to confront the hard truths of our sinfulness and the staggering cost of our redemption. It is an invitation to live in a manner that reflects the depth of our gratitude for the grace we have received, a life that shines as a testament to the transformative power of the gospel. This is not a call to a comfortable or easy faith, but to a faith that is robust, dynamic, and unyielding in the face of trials, rooted in the unshakable truths of God's Word. In the heart of Paul's letter to the Colossians, a profound and challenging passage unfolds in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, a section that not only deepens our understanding of Christ's nature and role, but also fundamentally shapes our approach to faith and life. This portion of Scripture builds upon the earlier teachings in the letter, where Paul has already laid a foundation of gratitude, prayer, and wisdom, preparing us to grasp the magnificent truths about Christ that follow. As we approach these verses, we are called to reflect deeply on the supremacy and centrality of Christ in all things. This is not a comfortable, easy message tailored to our preferences, but a stark, unvarnished declaration of the truth about the Son of God. 
It challenges us to look beyond our limited, earthbound perspectives and see the cosmic reality of Christ's reign and authority. This passage, therefore, stands as a beacon, illuminating the truth about Christ in a world often clouded by confusion and false teachings. It confronts us with the reality of who Christ is, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, the one in whom and for whom all things were created, the sustainer of all things, and the head of the church. These truths are not only central to our understanding of the scripture, but are also crucial in shaping our daily lives as followers of Christ. As we delve into this rich and challenging portion of scripture, let us do so with open hearts and minds, ready to be transformed by the truth of God's word. Let us embrace the profound implications of Christ's supremacy, allowing it to guide us in our worship, our service, and our daily walk with God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 declares a profound and essential truth. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In this passage, we are confronted with the absolute deity of Christ. He is not a mere representation or symbol, but the very embodiment of God himself, making the unseen God visible to us. As the firstborn over all creation, Christ holds preeminence in everything. This title, firstborn, signifies not only his priority in time, but also his supremacy in position. It is a direct challenge to any worldly understanding that seeks to diminish his divine nature or authority. In Christ, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, we are given the clearest revelation of who God is. This verse calls us to acknowledge and revere Christ's divine nature and his lordship over all creation. It is a clarion call to realign our lives, our worship, and our understanding under the truth of his supreme authority. This is not a comfortable or palatable truth for a world that often seeks to relegate Christ to the status of a mere moral teacher or historical figure. It demands our full recognition of Christ as Lord and God, the central figure of all existence and history. Building upon the profound truth of Christ's nature as revealed in verse 15, we venture deeper into the mystery of his divine authority and creative power in verse 16. This verse states, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Here, the scripture unveils the magnitude of Christ's sovereignty, affirming that every facet of existence, every realm, be it seen or unseen, every authority and power owes its existence to him. This is not merely a poetic expression, but a fundamental truth that situates Christ at the center of all creation. It challenges us to acknowledge his lordship over all realms, be they earthly or heavenly. This revelation demands a response that goes beyond mere acknowledgement. It calls for a life lived in the light of his absolute authority. Every throne, dominion, principality and power is under his command, and thus our allegiance, our service, and our very lives should be oriented towards His glory. This understanding reshapes our worldview, placing Christ as the focal point of all history and existence and redefining our purpose to align with His sovereign will. In the wake of acknowledging Christ's supreme role in creation, as revealed in verse 16, we are led to a further profound truth in verse 17, which declares, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. This verse underscores the eternal pre-existence of Christ, affirming his timeless sovereignty before the dawn of creation. It is a truth that transcends human understanding, placing Christ not only as the architect, but also as the sustainer of all that exists. 
Every molecule, every star, every life is held together by his powerful word. This reality demands our utmost reverence and awe, for in him the very fabric of reality finds its coherence and purpose. It is a sobering reminder that our lives, fleeting and transient, are sustained by his eternal, unchanging nature. In a world that often feels fragmented and chaotic, this verse offers a bedrock of stability and certainty. Christ is the unshakable foundation, the unchanging constant in an ever-changing world. Our faith, therefore, is not placed in a distant, detached deity, but in the active, sustaining Lord of all, who holds all creation together in his mighty hand. This understanding calls us to a life of steadfast faith, rooted in the assurance of his enduring presence and power in every aspect of our existence. Flowing seamlessly from the truth of Christ as the sustainer of all things in verse 17, we delve into the heart of the church's identity in verse 18, which proclaims, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. This verse illuminates the unparalleled role of Christ as the head of the church. Just as a body cannot function without its head, so the church cannot exist apart from Christ. He is the source of its life, the author of its faith, and the pioneer of its salvation. As the firstborn from the dead, he blazed the trail of resurrection, offering us a hope that transcends the grave. This positions him not only as the foundation of the church's existence, but also as the exemplar of its future glory. The church, therefore, is not a human institution, but a living organism, dynamically connected to its Lord and Savior. This profound truth challenges every believer to realign their life and service in accordance with his divine headship. In all things, Christ must have the preeminence, guiding the church's mission, shaping its worship, and molding its character. This is a hard but necessary truth, calling the church to a relentless pursuit of Christ's supremacy in every aspect of its communal and individual life. In the majestic journey through Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 18, we have beheld the unrivaled glory and authority of Christ. From being the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, to the sustainer of all things and the head of the church, these verses encapsulate the core of our faith, Christ's absolute preeminence in all realms of existence. This is not a mere theological concept to be admired from afar. It is the very heartbeat of our faith, calling us to a life of unwavering devotion and submission to his sovereign will. The implications of these truths are profound and far-reaching. In Christ, we see the perfect revelation of God, a bridge between the divine and humanity, beckoning us to a deeper relationship with our Creator. His role as the sustainer of all things offers us assurance and hope in a world often riddled with uncertainty and despair. As the head of the church, he calls us to unity and purpose, aligning our individual and collective pursuits with his divine plan. This journey through Scripture is not just an intellectual exercise, it is a call to action. It demands of us a life of humility, recognizing our dependence on Christ for our very existence. It challenges us to elevate Christ above all else in our lives, seeking His glory in every thought, word, and deed. As the Church, we are urged to uphold His teachings, to be a beacon of His love and truth, in a world that often walks in darkness. These verses offer us a glimpse into the majesty and authority of Christ, inviting us to respond with awe, worship, and obedience. They remind us that our faith is anchored in the unshakable truth of Christ's supremacy, a truth that should guide every aspect of our lives. Let us therefore embrace this truth with fervor, living each day in the light of Christ's glorious preeminence.
In approaching the powerful and pivotal message of Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 through 20, we must first immerse ourselves in the rich context of this epistle. The Apostle Paul, writing to the believers in Colossae, seeks to establish them in the truth amid a world rife with spiritual confusion and deception. From the outset of this letter, Paul lays a foundation that is Christ-centric, affirming the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus in all things. This theme reaches a crescendo in verses 19 and 20, where the fullness of Christ's deity and the scope of his redemptive work are brought into sharp focus. Prior to these verses, Paul has masterfully woven a tapestry of truth about Christ's preeminence in creation and the church. He speaks of Christ as the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, in whom and through whom all things were created. This Christological hymn, verses 15 through 18, anchors the believer's faith in the unshakable reality of Christ's lordship over every aspect of existence. It is against this backdrop that verses 19 and 20 must be understood. As we delve into these verses, we are not merely engaging with theological concepts. We are encountering the heart of the gospel itself. Here, the divinity of Christ and the purpose of his incarnation are proclaimed with clarity and authority. These verses challenge us to look beyond a superficial understanding of Jesus and embrace him as the central figure in God's plan of redemption, a plan that encompasses not just individual salvation, but the reconciliation of all things. Therefore, this passage is not just for contemplation, but for transformation. It calls us to a renewed awe of who Christ is and a deeper commitment to what he has done. In a world that often dilutes or distorts the message of the cross, these verses stand as a beacon of truth, calling us back to the heart of our faith. The glorious mystery of God made manifest in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Let us then approach these verses with open hearts and minds, ready to be challenged, changed and charged by the profound truths they contain. Colossians chapter 1 verse 19 states, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. This verse stands as a monumental testament to the nature and work of Christ, affirming his divinity and central role in the Father's plan for redemption. To delve into this powerful scripture, let's first acknowledge the gravity of the phrase, it pleased the Father. Here, the sovereign will of God is unmistakably highlighted. The Father's pleasure is not a whimsical inclination, but a deliberate, purposeful decision rooted in his eternal wisdom and goodness. In choosing to place all the fullness in Christ, God is making a definitive statement about who Jesus is and what he represents. The term fullness here is pivotal. In the original language, this encompasses the entirety of God's nature and attributes. This is no mere partial endowment or limited empowerment. In Christ dwells the totality of God's being. His love, holiness, wisdom, power, and justice. This means that in looking at Christ, we see the Father himself, as Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. This truth is foundational to understanding the person and work of Jesus. He is not merely a moral teacher, an enlightened prophet, or a miraculous healer. He is God incarnate, the second person of the Trinity, fully divine yet fully human. In him, the divine and human meet, providing the only way for sinful humanity to be reconciled to a holy God. Moreover, this verse underpins the gospel message. The fullness dwelling in Christ signifies that he is completely sufficient for our salvation. There is nothing lacking in him. No additional works, rituals, or mediators are needed. Our redemption is wholly accomplished through his life, death, and resurrection. This is a profound and humbling truth 
that demands our wholehearted faith and unwavering trust. In a world that often promotes a diluted or distorted view of Jesus, Colossians chapter 1 verse 19 calls us back to the biblical truth of his supreme and unique place in God's redemptive plan. It challenges us to acknowledge and worship Christ not just as a part of our lives, but as the very center of our existence and the full expression of God's love and grace towards us. Thus, Colossians chapter 1 verse 19 is not just a theological statement. It's a call to a faith that recognizes and reveres Christ for who he truly is, the full embodiment of God, the cornerstone of our faith, and the sole source of our salvation. Building on the profound declaration of verse 19, where it is affirmed that all the fullness of God dwells in Christ, we are ushered into the next verse, verse 20, which states, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. This verse seamlessly extends the grand narrative of Christ's divinity and mission. It reveals the cosmic scope of Jesus' reconciling work. The phrase, to reconcile all things to himself, is a striking exposition of the gospel's vast reach. This reconciliation is not limited to humanity alone, but encompasses the entire creation, things on earth and in heaven. It speaks to the profound disruption caused by sin, not just in human relationships with God, but in the entire created order. The means of this reconciliation is crucially significant, through the blood of his cross. Here, we confront the stark, unvarnished truth of the gospel. Reconciliation was not achieved through a display of earthly power or wisdom, but through the suffering and death of Christ on the cross. The blood of Christ signifies the ultimate sacrifice, the sinless Son of God bearing the weight of our sins. This is not a truth to be glossed over or sentimentalized, it is the sobering reality of the price paid for our redemption. This verse challenges any notion that minimizes the gravity of sin or the necessity of atonement. It underscores the justice of God, which required a perfect sacrifice for sin and His love in providing His own Son as that sacrifice. The cross, then, is not just a symbol of love or sacrifice. It is the definitive demonstration of God's justice satisfied and His mercy extended. In verse 20, we are also presented with the result of Christ's work, having made peace. This peace is not merely an absence of conflict, but a restored relationship with God. Through Christ's blood, the enmity caused by sin is overcome, and we are brought into a state of peace with God, a relationship no longer defined by guilt and estrangement, but by grace and reconciliation. Thus, Colossians 1.20 compels us to look at the cross with a sense of awe and gratitude. It reminds us that our faith is rooted not in human wisdom or power, but in the sacrificial death and resurrection of Christ. This truth should not only humble us, but also inspire us to live in the light of the reconciliation we have received, to be ambassadors of this peace in a world that is deeply fractured by sin and desperately in need of the saving grace of Christ. In reflecting on the profound messages of Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, we are confronted with truths that are both awe-inspiring and deeply humbling. These verses unveil the majestic identity of Christ and the unparalleled scope of His redemptive work. In Him, the fullness of God is pleased to dwell and through his blood, a cosmic reconciliation is accomplished, a reconciliation that spans heaven and earth, restoring all creation back to its rightful relationship with the Creator. This passage challenges us to embrace a faith that is rooted in the profound mysteries of God's plan, a plan that culminated in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. It's a stark reminder that our salvation 
is not a light matter. It was purchased at the highest price, the blood of the Son of God. This truth should shake us to our core and cause us to fall to our knees in worship, recognizing the depth of our sin and the immensity of God's grace. Moreover, these verses call us to a life of profound gratitude and purpose. Understanding the extent of what Christ has accomplished should transform how we live. Our lives are no longer our own. They are bought with a price. This realization should propel us into a life of faithful service marked by a deep love for God and a sacrificial love for others. We are now ambassadors of this reconciliation called to spread the message of the cross, a message of hope, peace, and restoration to a world that is in desperate need of a savior. Furthermore, in a culture that often promotes a watered-down version of Christianity, these verses serve as a clarion call to uphold the unchanging truths of Scripture. We are reminded that the gospel is not just about personal fulfillment or moral improvement, but about God's plan to restore a fallen world through the person and work of Jesus Christ. This should embolden us to stand firm in our faith, unwavering in our commitment to the truth of God's Word. Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 through 20 presents us with a vision of Christ that demands our utmost reverence and devotion. It's a call to behold the glory of the Son of God, to marvel at the breadth of His reconciliation, and to live in the light of His redemptive work. Let us, therefore, hold fast to these truths, allowing them to shape our hearts, guide our steps, and fuel our mission as we journey through this life ever fixed on the glorious hope laid before us in Christ Jesus. In embarking upon an exploration of Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, we delve into a passage rich with the profound truths of redemption and the call to steadfast faith. This section of scripture nestled within the broader context of Paul's letter to the Colossians, stands as a beacon of hope and a solemn charge to believers. Prior to these verses, Paul has laid a foundation of profound doctrinal truths, affirming Christ's supremacy and the completeness of his work in creation and redemption. From verses 1 through 20, we are presented with a Christ who is preeminent in all things, the very image of the invisible God in whom all fullness dwells and through whom reconciliation is made possible. This Christological focus is not merely doctrinal, it's deeply personal, underscoring the direct impact of Christ's Lordship on our lives. Now, moving into verses 21 through 23, the focus shifts from the cosmic scope of Christ's work to its personal application in the lives of believers. These verses confront us with the stark reality of our former alienation from God, a truth that may be uncomfortable, but is essential in understanding the depth of what follows. We are not merely distant or indifferent to God. Our natural state is one of active opposition to Him. This realization is crucial, for it magnifies the grace and mercy that follow. Then, in a dramatic contrast, we are led into the heart of the gospel message reconciliation and transformation through Christ. It is here that the magnitude of Christ's work is made intimately clear. We, who were once enemies, are now presented as holy, blameless, and above reproach through Christ's sacrificial death. This transformation is radical, complete, and solely the work of Christ's grace. Yet, as verse 23 reminds us, this glorious truth comes with a call to endurance in the faith. The assurance of our reconciliation and transformation is accompanied by an exhortation to remain steadfast, grounded in the gospel. This is not a passive faith, but an active, persevering commitment to the truths we have received and to the hope laid out before us. In sum, Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 through 23 encapsulates the core of the Christian message.
our profound need for redemption, the complete sufficiency of Christ's atoning work, and the call to live in the light of these truths. As we journey through these verses, let us do so with a heart open to the full weight of their implications, rejoicing in the grace we have received and resolved to persevere in the faith we profess. Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 states, And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. This verse, a profound declaration from the Apostle Paul, addresses a fundamental human condition and the transformative power of Christ's redemption. We were alienated, separated from God, not merely by circumstance, but by our very nature. Our thoughts and actions, steeped in sin, rendered us enemies of God. It's a harsh truth, but one that pierces the heart with its accuracy. We weren't just lost. We were actively opposing God through our wicked works. But the verse does not leave us in this state of despair. The shift from past to present in this verse is monumental. Yet now, he has reconciled. These words signal a dramatic change, a divine intervention. God, in his infinite mercy, didn't leave us in our state of alienation. Through Christ, he bridged the chasm that sin had created. This reconciliation is not something we earned. It is a gift of grace. It's not a result of our efforts, but of Christ's sacrificial work on the cross. This message is not one of mere comfort. It's a call to acknowledge the depth of our sin and the magnitude of God's grace. We must not trivialize our past state of enmity with God, nor should we underestimate the radical nature of the reconciliation achieved through Christ. It's a transformation that demands our wholehearted response, a life lived in gratitude, obedience, and reverence for the one who redeemed us from our wretched state. In understanding this verse, we grasp the seriousness of our sin and the astounding nature of God's grace. It's a sobering reflection, but one that fills us with awe and leads us to worship. For in Christ, we who were once far off have been brought near, not by our merit, but by his loving sacrifice. Continuing from verse 21, which vividly portrays our former estrangement and enmity with God, we are led to the next verse, verse 22, which declares, In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. This verse builds upon the profound truth of our reconciliation with God. It's not just that we were enemies and now are not. It's that through Christ's sacrifice, specifically in the body of his flesh through death, we are transformed. This transformation is not merely a change in status. It's a complete overhaul of our identity. We are presented as holy, blameless, and above reproach. Let's unpack this staggering declaration. First, consider the means of this transformation, Christ's bodily sacrifice. It underscores the physical, tangible nature of Christ's suffering for our sake. He bore our sins in his body, and through his death, he paid the penalty that was rightfully ours. This isn't a metaphorical or symbolic act, it's a historical, physical reality that has spiritual implications of infinite magnitude. Then, we must grapple with the result of this sacrifice. We are presented as holy, blameless, and above reproach. These terms are absolutes. To be holy is to be set apart for God, to be blameless is to be free from the accusation of sin, and to be above reproach means that even the most scrutinous examination cannot find fault. This is not a reflection of our inherent goodness, but a testament to the perfect efficacy of Christ's sacrifice. This transformation challenges us deeply. It demands a response of awe and reverence, yes, but also of self-examination. If we are to be presented as holy, blameless, and above reproach, then our lives must reflect this transformation. This isn't about earning God's favor. 
It's about living in the reality of what Christ has already accomplished. It's about striving in the power of the Spirit to live lives that are worthy of the calling we've received. In essence, this verse shows us the incredible destination of our journey with Christ. From enemies to heirs, from alienated to adored, our story is one of radical redemption. It's a narrative that should stir our hearts, not just to emotion, but to action. As we reflect on the magnitude of what Christ has done, let it move us to live lives that honor His sacrifice, lives that demonstrate the transformative power of His grace and love. Having delved into the profound truths of verse 22, where we are presented as holy, blameless, and above reproach through Christ's sacrifice, we now turn to verse 23. This verse reads, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. This verse serves as both a reassurance and a sobering reminder. The promise of our transformation and presentation as blameless before God is secure, yet it comes with a vital condition, our continued faithfulness. The phrase, if indeed you continue in the faith, is not to be taken lightly. It's a call to perseverance, to a steadfastness in our walk with Christ. This isn't about earning salvation through works. Rather, it's an affirmation that true faith manifests in a life that remains rooted and firm in the gospel. The admonition to not be moved away from the hope of the gospel is especially poignant. In a world rife with distractions and false teachings, maintaining a steadfast faith is a challenge. It's a call to discernment, to hold fast to the truth of the gospel as it has been proclaimed, and not to be swayed by every new doctrine or worldly philosophy that seeks to undermine it. Moreover, this verse speaks to the universal nature of the gospel message. It was preached to every creature under heaven, emphasizing its inclusivity and the broad scope of God's redemptive plan. This universal call demands a response from us, not just in belief, but in action. As believers, we are entrusted with this gospel, called to be ministers of this hope, just as Paul was. In essence, verse 23 serves as a battle cry to endurance in faith. It's a reminder that our walk with Christ is not a momentary decision, but a lifelong journey. It encourages us to remain grounded in the truth of the gospel, resisting the forces that would seek to move us away from our hope in Christ. It's a call to a living faith, one that continually grows and bears fruit as we abide in Him. As we reflect on this verse, let it stir in us a renewed commitment to hold fast to our faith, to live in the hope of the gospel, and to be steadfast in our proclamation of its truth to the world. In reflecting on Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, we are confronted with a narrative of profound transformation and challenged with a call to steadfast faithfulness. These verses encapsulate the essence of the gospel and its transformative power in our lives. Verse 21 starts by acknowledging our former state, alienated and enemies of God due to our wicked deeds. This stark truth sets the stage for understanding the magnitude of what follows. We were not merely lost or misguided, we were active opponents of God's righteousness. The gravity of this cannot be understated. It's a hard truth that drives us to humility and repentance. Then, in verse 22, the focus shifts dramatically to the redemptive work of Christ. Through His physical sacrifice, His death on the cross, we are presented as holy, blameless, and above reproach before God. This is a staggering transformation, one that underscores the completeness of Christ's work on our behalf. It's not a partial change, it's a total overhaul of our identity. 
This verse invites us to marvel at the grace of God, which takes us from a state of enmity to one of righteousness, not through our own merit, but solely through Christ's atoning work. Verse 23 brings a pivotal point, the necessity of continuing steadfast in the faith. The promise of reconciliation and transformation is secure, yet it is contingent upon our perseverance in the faith. This isn't a suggestion of salvation by works. Rather, it's an affirmation that true faith will inevitably manifest in a life that remains grounded in the gospel. This verse exhorts us to not be swayed by the changing tides of culture or philosophy, but to cling unwaveringly to the hope of the gospel. Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 through 23 presents a holistic view of the Christian journey. It begins with acknowledging our sinful state, celebrates the redemptive work of Christ, and culminates in a call to faithful perseverance. This passage challenges us to a deep introspection of our spiritual state, encourages us with the assurance of Christ's complete redemption, and exhorts us to a steadfast commitment to the faith. It is a call to both gratitude and responsibility, a reminder that while we are saved by grace, we are called to live in response to that grace, firmly rooted in the truth of the gospel and unshaken in our commitment to Christ. This is the essence of our faith, a relentless pursuit of Christ, grounded in the truth of his word and a life lived in reflection of his transformative work within us. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29, nestled within an epistle rich in doctrinal depth and practical wisdom, Paul presents a stirring and challenging portion of Scripture that speaks directly to the heart of the believer's journey. Following his earlier exposition on the supremacy of Christ and the reconciliation achieved through his sacrifice, these verses delve into the real, lived experience of the faith. Here, Paul interweaves the seemingly paradoxical concepts of rejoicing in suffering, the grandeur of a revealed divine mystery, and the relentless pursuit of spiritual maturity in Christ. These themes, far from being abstract theological ideas, are presented as tangible realities that every believer is called to embrace. They challenge us to a deeper commitment, urging us to understand that our walk with Christ involves not only the joy of salvation, but also the responsibility of sharing in his sufferings, comprehending the profound mystery of Christ in us, and laboring diligently in his strength for the growth and edification of the church. This passage, therefore, stands as a call for a robust, active faith that shapes every aspect of our lives, driving us to live out the profound implications of the gospel in both word and deed. Colossians chapter 1 verse 24, a verse of profound depth and spiritual significance, speaks directly to the heart of every believer, offering insight into the mystery and beauty of Christ's work in us. The verse reads, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. At first glance, this passage might raise eyebrows. How can anything be lacking in Christ's afflictions? To understand this, we must delve into the rich tapestry of scriptural truth. Christ's sufferings, culminating in his death on the cross, were complete and perfect, fully atoning for sin. Nothing can be added to his redemptive work. It is finished and wholly sufficient. However, the lacking here does not refer to a deficiency in Christ's atonement. Rather, it speaks of the ongoing suffering that the body of Christ, the Church, endures in this world. As believers, we are united with Christ not only in his resurrection and victory, but also in his sufferings. This union means that as we experience hardships and trials for the sake of the gospel, we are, in a sense, participating in the afflictions of Christ. Paul expresses joy in his sufferings for the sake of the Church because he knows that his trials serve a higher purpose. They are a means through which the Church is built up, strengthened, and encouraged. His sufferings and ours become part of God's redemptive history, showcasing the power of Christ working in and through his people. Verse 24 is a call to embrace the hardships we face for Christ with joy and purpose. 
It's a reminder that our sufferings are not in vain, but are instrumental in God's grand design. It encourages us to look beyond our present struggles, seeing them as a way to deepen our fellowship with Christ and advance His kingdom. This verse beckons us to a deeper understanding of the Christian life. It's not just about personal salvation and comfort, but about being part of something larger, the body of Christ, serving, suffering, and triumphing together for the glory of God. This perspective shifts our focus from our own trials to the greater purpose they serve in God's plan, enabling us to endure with hope and joy. Continuing from verse 24, which beautifully illustrates our participation in Christ's sufferings for the sake of His body, the Church, we transition seamlessly into the next verse. Verse 25 states, Of which I became a minister, according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. This verse is a powerful testament to the divine calling and mission entrusted to Paul, and by extension, to each of us as believers. Paul identifies himself as a minister, a servant appointed by God. The term minister here is not about a title or position of authority, it's about service and stewardship. It underscores the responsibility entrusted to Paul, and indeed to all who follow Christ, to serve his church faithfully. The phrase, according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you, reveals the heart of God's calling. Stewardship here implies a sacred trust, a responsibility given by God to manage, declare, and spread His Word. This stewardship is not for personal gain or glory, but is given for you, for the benefit of the Church, the body of Christ. It highlights the selfless nature of Christian ministry, where the focus is on serving others, guided by God's purposes and plans. Moreover, the purpose of this stewardship is profound, to fulfill the Word of God. This goes beyond merely conveying information. It's about bringing the divine message to completion in the hearts and lives of the listeners. It speaks to the transformative power of God's Word, not just to inform, but to change lives, to bring to fruition God's plan of redemption and restoration. In connecting these verses, we see a profound truth. Our sufferings and service are part of a larger narrative. Just as Paul's afflictions contributed to the benefit of the Church, his role as a minister was about faithfully executing the task God entrusted to him. Each believer, then, is called to embrace both the hardships and the stewardship given by God, knowing that both are integral to the unfolding of His divine plan. Verse 25 is not just about Paul's apostolic commission. It's a reminder to all believers of our calling to serve, to steward the gospel, and to participate in the fulfillment of God's Word. It's an invitation to view our roles in the Church not just as tasks or duties, but as sacred trusts from God designed to advance His kingdom and bring His redemptive plan to completion. Building upon the profound themes in verse 25 about stewardship and fulfilling the Word of God, we delve into verse 26, which states, The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to His saints. This verse is a cornerstone in understanding God's grand narrative and His plan for humanity. The term mystery in this context is crucial. In the scriptural sense, a mystery is not something unknowable. Rather, it is a truth that was once hidden, but is now revealed by God. This mystery, which had been concealed for ages and generations, is no ordinary secret. It encompasses the breadth and depth of God's plan for salvation, a plan that spans the entirety of human history. What is remarkable about this mystery is that it was hidden from ages and from generations. This indicates that throughout the epochs of human history, through the various generations, this profound truth remained undisclosed. It was not because God was unable or unwilling to reveal it, but because the timing and unfolding of this revelation were according to His perfect plan and purpose. But the most awe-inspiring aspect is that this once hidden truth has been revealed to His saints. This revelation was not given to the mighty, the elite, or the wise of this world, but to His saints, to those who are set apart by faith in Christ. This is a radical shift from the expectations of the world, where secrets are often reserved for the privileged few. In God's economy, the most profound truths are given to the humble, to those who come to Him in faith. This revelation to the saints is not just about knowledge, it's about relationship and participation in God's plan. As saints, believers are not just passive recipients of this mystery, they are active participants in it. This mystery involves the indwelling Christ, the hope of glory, and the spreading of the gospel to all corners of the earth, 
breaking down barriers that once seemed insurmountable. In linking this verse with the previous one, we see a seamless continuation of thought. Paul's stewardship and ministry, his sufferings and service, are all part of unveiling this great mystery. Likewise, each believer is called to partake in this revelation. It's not just Paul's story, it's our story as part of the body of Christ. We are entrusted with this revealed mystery, called to live it out and proclaim it, making known the manifold wisdom of God to a world in desperate need of His saving grace. Verse 26 beckons us to marvel at the wisdom of God, who chose to reveal the depths of His love and plan for redemption in a way that defies human wisdom. It invites us to embrace our role in this divine narrative, to cherish the revelation of this mystery, and to live in the light of this profound truth. Continuing from verse 26, we transition to the heart of this revelation in verse 27. The verse reads, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This verse is a breathtaking unveiling of the essence of the mystery. It tells us that God, in His sovereign will, chose to make known the riches of the glory of this mystery, not just to a select few, but among the Gentiles as well. This was a radical, groundbreaking truth, especially in the context of a predominantly Jewish understanding of God's plan. The Gentiles, who were once considered outsiders to the covenant promises, are now fully included in the plan of salvation. This inclusion reflects the boundless grace and mercy of God, extending His love and salvation to all humanity, transcending ethnic, cultural, and national boundaries. But what exactly is this mystery? The answer is profound yet beautifully simple. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the crux of the Christian faith, the cornerstone of our belief. Christ dwelling in the believer is not merely a theological concept, it's a living reality. It signifies a union with Christ, a transformative relationship where the believer's identity is found in Him. This indwelling is the source of our hope, not a wishful thinking, but a confident assurance in the glory to come. Christ in you implies that the life we now live is not ours but Christ's. Our thoughts, actions, and our very being are to be reflections of Him. This indwelling Christ is a powerful force, transforming us from within, making us new creations, and enabling us to live lives that glorify God. The hope of glory points to the future reality that believers will share in the glory of Christ. This hope is not just for the life to come. It starts now, in this present life. It's a hope that sustains, empowers, and motivates us to persevere through trials and tribulations, knowing that our future in Christ is secure and glorious. In connecting this verse to the previous ones, we see a clear progression. The mystery, hidden for ages but now revealed, is that through Christ's redemptive work, all people, Jews and Gentiles alike, have access to God. This mystery is not just knowledge to be understood, but a reality to be lived, Christ living in us, transforming us, and giving us a hope that is both present and future. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 invites us to dwell on this magnificent truth, the indwelling Christ as our hope of glory. It challenges us to live out this reality, letting Christ's life be manifest in us and sharing this glorious truth with the world around us. This is our heritage and our calling as believers to be bearers of this incredible mystery, living testimonies of Christ's life and hope within us. As we move from the profound truth of verse 27, where we learn of the indwelling Christ as our hope of glory, we progress to verse 28, which beautifully articulates our response to this mystery. The verse reads, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. This verse encapsulates the mission and purpose of the Christian life. The phrase, Him we preach, focuses our attention squarely on Christ. It's not about preaching ideas, philosophies, or ourselves, but Christ and Him crucified, the core of the gospel message. This preaching is not just for a select few, it is for every man, emphasizing the universal call of the gospel. The message of Christ's redeeming love is not bound by geographical, cultural, or social limits. It is for all humanity. Furthermore, the verse underscores the dual aspects of the ministry, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Warning speaks to the reality of sin, 
the judgment to come, and the need for repentance. It's about helping people understand the serious consequences of living apart from God and the urgency of turning to Christ. Teaching, on the other hand, involves instructing believers in the truths of Scripture, guiding them in understanding the profound riches of their faith and helping them grow in their walk with the Lord. This teaching is done in all wisdom, implying that it is grounded in the fear of the Lord, the true source of wisdom. The ultimate goal of this preaching, warning, and teaching is presented in the final clause, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The word perfect here does not imply sinless perfection in this life, but rather maturity in Christ. It speaks of a completeness, a fullness of character that reflects Christ. The aim is to see believers grow in their faith, understanding and love for the Lord, maturing into the full stature of Christ. In linking this with the previous verse, the flow of thought is clear. The incredible truth of Christ in us, our hope of glory, propels us into action. It compels us to share Christ with others, to engage in the ministry of preaching, warning, and teaching, all with the aim of helping others grow in their relationship with Christ. Our response to this great mystery is not passive, it's active and dynamic, involving a deep commitment to the gospel and a passionate desire to see lives transformed by the power of Christ. Verse 28 is a call to all believers. It challenges us to embrace our role in God's redemptive plan, to be faithful stewards of the gospel message, and to labor tirelessly in the ministry entrusted to us. It's a call to make Christ known, to invest in the spiritual growth of others, and to strive towards presenting everyone perfect in Christ. This is our mission, our purpose, and our joy as followers of Jesus. Moving from the compelling charge in verse 28, where we are called to preach Christ, warning and teaching every person with the aim of presenting them mature in Him, we arrive at verse 29. This verse says, To this end I also labor, striving according to His working which works in me mightily. Here we find a profound expression of commitment and divine empowerment. The Apostle Paul, speaking from his personal experience, encapsulates the essence of Christian ministry and service. To this end I also labor, he declares, showing that his life's work, his tireless effort, is dedicated to the mission outlined in the previous verse, preaching Christ and nurturing spiritual maturity in the believers. The word labor here is not just about ordinary work. It denotes an intense effort, a toil that involves both physical and spiritual exertion. It's the kind of work that is often demanding and challenging, requiring perseverance and dedication. This labor, however, is not in human strength alone. Paul immediately points us to the source of his strength, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. This part of the verse is key to understanding Christian service. The term striving implies an intense effort, akin to an athlete straining toward the finish line. Yet this striving is not based on human capability, it is according to his working. This indicates that it is God's power at work within Paul, enabling him to carry out his ministry. It's a divine empowerment, a might that surpasses human ability. The phrase, which works in me mightily, underscores the magnitude of this divine power. It's not a mere aid or a boost to Paul's efforts. It's a mighty force, actively and powerfully at work within him. This divine empowerment is what enables Paul, and indeed every believer, to fulfill the calling God has placed on their lives. It's a reminder that in our service for Christ, whether in preaching, teaching, or any form of ministry, we are not relying on our strength, but on God's power working in and through us. Linking this verse with the previous one, we see a complete picture of Christian ministry. We are called to a high and holy task to preach Christ and strive for the maturity of every believer. This task is beyond our natural ability, but we are not left to accomplish it in our own strength. God himself empowers us, working mightily within us to accomplish his purposes. Verse 29 is an encouragement and a reassurance to every believer engaged in the work of the Lord. It calls us to labor earnestly in our God-given tasks, yet always reliant on his mighty power at work within us. It's a reminder that in our weakness, his strength is made perfect, and in our efforts, his power is supremely displayed. This verse, then, is not just about Paul's ministry, it's about the calling and empowerment of every believer who seeks to serve the Lord with all their heart. 
In the heart-stirring passage of Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29, we find a compelling call to embrace the fullness of Christian life, a life that interweaves suffering with purpose, mystery with revelation, and labor with divine power. Paul's words challenge us to recognize that following Christ is not a path of ease, but one of sacrificial love and steadfast endurance, underpinned by the magnificent truth of Christ in us, our hope of glory. This journey demands an unwavering commitment to proclaim the gospel with boldness and wisdom, ever conscious of the high stakes of eternal destiny. It's a journey not undertaken in our strength, but empowered by God's might, encouraging us to persevere in our calling with the assurance that our labor in the Lord is never in vain. These verses, therefore, call us not only to a deeper understanding, but to a life transformed and consumed by the relentless pursuit of glorifying God and making Christ known to every heart and every corner of the world.